And uh, I do want to say just uh, how blessed I am uh, by God to get to be part of this ministry. Uh, as I've shared with you, it's this place that made such a radical difference in my life. And to get to come back here and to see God at work in your lives is, is a real blessing. You've been an encouragement to me, and I am thankful for the privilege of sharing God's Word with you. I appreciate how attentive you are and how engaged you are with, with God's truth. And that's my heart for you this morning is this, uh, as we open God's Word today, that we'll be attentive and engaged to what He has for us. Before we do... I did make a promise, and I want to fulfill this promise. Some of you will know what I'm referencing, and some of you won't. But I think Isaiah Cohen does. So, all right, I keep my promises. Um, this message this morning, uh, I'm, I'm excited to bring to you because uh, as I prepared for uh, these chapel messages, it was really back last August that I actually felt God put on my heart to do this series on grace. And, and as I, uh, this spring, began to sort of lay out which messages I thought I would share and how the things would flow together, uh, I never quite felt God's peace about His direction for this last message for this Friday. And as I began to pray about it, and I began to just sort of scratch out the point of each day, uh, I came up with this great idea for this message today. And I wrote it down. And then I lost the paper. <laughs> Have you ever been there? And, and I didn't go anywhere. It was, I was in my office at our house, and, and I knew that the paper, it couldn't have left the building. You know what I'm saying? And so I went through my desk, I went through all the things. I went through the recycling container. It had a bunch of paper. I went through it like six times. You can ask Laura about this. I was obsessive. I was like, I have to find this paper because I had this great idea, and I can't remember it. Right? And, and it wasn't there. I looked everywhere. This, I went through the trash can. You know how gross that is. Nothing it would not turn up. And so, even coming here to camp, even up to this week, I wasn't sure what God wanted me to share with you today. I've been praying about it. I've been asking Him to show me. And really, I believe yesterday afternoon, God put on my heart what He wanted me to share with you this, this morning. So, uh, this is fresh, sort of hot off the presses, uh, but I am excited to share it with you. We've had the privilege these last couple of weeks to dive deep into God's grace. And it's my heart and my prayer that you will leave here gripped by God's life-changing grace. It's an eternity-altering grace. And I don't want you to just leave believing in that grace. I, I don't want you to just believe in grace. I want you to be captivated by God's grace. I, I want you to leave shaped and being shaped by God's grace, being strengthened by His grace. I, I want you to be more bold because of God's grace. I want you to be softer because of God's grace. And I want you to be gripped by it. Because His grace gives us forgiveness. His grace grants us right standing with Himself. His grace places us in the middle of His story. His grace gives us strength for the journey. And His grace secures our destiny. Isn't that good to know? That your destiny is secure by God's grace. His grace gives us the power to overcome the sin in our life and to live for His glory and His purposes. And that's my heart for you, is that being so gripped by the grace of God, being so overwhelmed by His loving kindness, that you would have a vision for your life to live for His glory and to live a life that's defined by grace. We've come across this verse a lot. It means a lot to me because it was here at camp that I first learned this verse. But Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. And that's the place that I want to bring you to this morning, where you would see that it's no longer about you anymore. It's about God in you. But Christ, Paul says, who lives in me is what my life is about. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, grace leads us to a place where we realize life isn't about me. Life isn't about you. It's about God. It's about Christ in me. Life is about Jesus because here's the thing. The gift of grace is the gift of Jesus. You see, when God gives us grace, He doesn't just give you forgiveness. He doesn't give, just give you the opportunity to go to heaven. He doesn't just give you the opportunity to live for His purposes and His glory. He doesn't just give you power and strength. He gives you Himself. Isn't that amazing that the gift of grace is that we get God? That you don't have to wait till you go to heaven. You get Him now. Look at how Paul says it in Colossians chapter 1, 
Verse 27, he says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. That's your position. That's your standing if you have been saved by the grace of God. Christ in you in you. That means your life is no longer your own. Your life is no longer about you. The story isn't so much centered on you anymore as it is centered on Jesus and who he is and what he's done. Our life should be more and more about Jesus and less and less about ourselves. That's grace at work in our life. And that's what happens when grace consumes our lives. And just for a few moments this morning, I want you to take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 19. And to look at a story about a man that you've heard about. A man that you've probably sang about. But I want us to look at his story because he was a man who was changed radically by the grace of God. And I want us to see the transformation that occurs in his life because I believe it gives us a powerful example about how our lives are to look when we respond to God's amazing grace. His name is Zacchaeus. What do you know about Zacchaeus? He was a wee little man, alright? We can sing that later, alright? Maybe you can sing that for lunch. He was a wee little guy. He was short. How many of you are short? All right. So you know what Zacchaeus has went through. Have you ever been in a crowd and couldn't see? Well, that's what we happen, we find in Luke chapter 19. As we get to Luke chapter 19, we are very near the end of Jesus' life. He is on his way to Jerusalem to die on a cross. He is on a journey. And in fact, we're just about a week away from Jesus' death. And so as Jesus is passing through a place called Jericho, it's a town that's down in the Jordan River Valley. And it's not terribly far from Jerusalem, but it is a very, a very different topography. It's down in the Jordan Valley. And as Jesus is coming through there, the crowds hear that Jesus is coming. And so the crowds are gathering around along the side of the road because people want to get a glimpse of Jesus as he passes by. But Zacchaeus is having a hard time. So let's join the story. Luke chapter 19 and beginning in verse 1. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. And there was a man named Zacchaeus and he was one of the most influential Jews in the Roman tax collecting business. Your translation may say he was the chief tax collector. Now, you've probably heard about tax collectors, right? They were not real popular guys in Israel. Right, because they had not only taken a job of being a tax collector, which in itself would probably not make you very popular, right? I mean, IRS agents aren't the most popular people in our world today, are they? In fact, if you're one, you probably don't go around talking about it. But they weren't just tax collectors. These were Jewish citizens who had contracted themselves out to collect Roman taxes. The Romans had occupied their land. They were the enemy and yet these men had sold themselves out. Many times they had to sell their property in order to become a tax collector. And to sell your property meant you were selling your stake, your claim in God's promised land. And so the tax collectors were viewed as traitors among the Jews. They were disliked. They were hated. And not only had they sold themselves out as traitors and were doing the bidding of the Roman government, but they would use their position to cheat people out of their money. Because here's how Rome viewed it. You get the taxes and whatever else you get is your pay. And so they would get as much as they could. And so look at the text here. It says this was one of the most influential. He was a chief tax collector. And he had become very rich. He was very wealthy. And he became wealthy by stealing people's money. I mean, that's what it amounted to. He stole people's money in order to become wealthy. He tried, it says this day though, to get a look at Jesus. But he was too short to see over the crowds. So we don't know all that's going on, but we know something's happening in Zacchaeus' heart. Because even though he's got it made financially, even though he's well positioned and well connected, he is broken inside. He might be filthy rich, but it very much appears that he's also guilty rich. 
He can't see over the crowd, so Zacchaeus runs ahead, verse 4, and climbed a sycamore tree beside the road so that he could watch from there. And then, in verse 5, the unexpected and unimaginable thing happens, right? Jesus comes by, and all Zacchaeus is hoping is to get a look at Jesus. But he had no idea that Jesus wanted to get a look at him. Look at what happens in verse 5. It says, when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus, and he called him by name. Zacchaeus! He said, quickly come down, for I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus, get out of that tree. We're going to have lunch at your place. Can you imagine how Zacchaeus felt? See, because when we get grace, it feels great. But when other people get grace, it doesn't always feel so good. And look at what happens. It says, Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the crowds were displeased. Zacchaeus, the guy that rips us off, the guy that steals from us, the guy that is dirty and a traitor and evil. Jesus, you're going to his house, why not my house? They said he has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, I will give my, half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I have overcharged people on their taxes, if, I like the if there, right? If, he says, I will give them back four times as much. And Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a son of Abraham. And I, the son of man, have come to seek and to save those like him who are lost. You see, grace intersected Zacchaeus' life that day. Jesus saw Zacchaeus, not just for his sin, but for who Jesus could make him to be. And he said, Zacchaeus, I have an appointment with you today. Remember, he is the God who chooses and the God who seeks. And he sought out Zacchaeus that day. As Zacchaeus sought to see Jesus, Jesus was seeking him. And when grace intersected Zacchaeus' life, his life was changed forever. Do you see the transformation that grace made? Zacchaeus says, I realize now what I've done and I don't want to live the same way anymore. Well, I'm going to give half my wealth away and then I'm not only going to do that, but all the people that I've cheated, I'm going to pay them back and I'm not just going to pay them back and I'm not just going to pay them back twice or even three times, but four times what I've taken. You see, grace intersected Zacchaeus' life and when grace intersects our life, it changes us. You can't encounter the radical grace of God in your heart and in your life and be the same person that you used to be. It's just not possible. Grace that saves us changes us. And if it isn't changing us, it isn't saving us. Look what happened. Look at verse 8 again. He says, I will give my wealth to the poor. Zacchaeus was a greedy guy. Zacchaeus, for all his time up to this point, had been a guy who was all about what can I grab for myself? What can I take? Because life is about me. Life is about getting as much as I can get because I am the center of my existence. And isn't that the natural way that we think about our lives? Apart from Christ, we will naturally come to a place where we think that we are the center of maybe not the universe, but at least our own existence. But grace says you're not the center of existence. God is, and it changed Zacchaeus' life. He went being from greedy to being generous. He was the guy that was the swindler, the cheater, the guy that would pickpocket his grandfather. I mean, that's the kind of guy that Zacchaeus' was. If there was a way to make a buck, he would make a buck. I believe that when Jesus heard Zacchaeus' proclamation, that he got out one of his grace happens here signs and he went out and hung it on Zacchaeus' doorposts. Now I don't know if that really happened or not but I do know what Jesus said. Look at verse 9. Jesus said salvation has come to this home today. And Zacchaeus wasn't saved because he gave his money away. He was saved by God's grace and his belief in who Jesus was. And that caused him to live differently. He says this man has shown himself to be a true son 
of Abraham. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Think about that. He said, I, the Son of Man, have come to seek and to save that which is lost. You see, Jesus loves to lavish his grace on people who don't deserve it. And we talked about the fact that we're Barabbas, right? We are doomed, we are dead, and we deserve it. But Jesus took our place. He absorbed the Father's wrath on our behalf. And God delights in displaying his grace to undeserving people. And the Jewish people, the, especially the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they had a real hard time figuring this thing out that, that they didn't deserve God any more than anyone else did. And they really thought there were people who deserved God and there were people who didn't. But Jesus came with the message that no one deserves my grace and yet my grace is available for anyone. And Jesus delights in lavishing his grace on undeserving sinners. And it ticked people off. It made the religious people mad. But it never stopped him, and it never stopped his mission from lavishing generous grace on undeserving sinners. I don't want you to ever get over the fact that God has lavished his grace on you. You don't deserve his grace, but he gives it to you freely and willingly out of his incredible love for you and out of his desire for your life to be a display of what his grace can do of what his power can do for his glory, for his kingdom, and his purpose, all because of his incredible love for you and I. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us. I, I've used that word a few times this morning because I want you to get the extravagance of God's love. That word lavish, right? It, it's a word that speaks to the extent of how God gives his love and his grace to you and to I. How great the Father's love that he has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. I want to ask you this this morning, has God's grace overtaken your life? Has his grace intersected your life in such a way that you've been gripped by it? In such a way that you now want to live for his kingdom and for his glory? He saved you. He's your redeemer. And never ever forget the price that he paid for you. Peter put it this way. He says, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. He says, God paid a ransom. We're, we're familiar with a ransom, right? It, it's what a, someone who takes a hostage demands be paid in order to release the hostage. And you see, we're all held hostage by sin. And our price had to be paid. And it says, God paid the ransom to save you from the empty life, the meaningless life that you inherited from your ancestors, cut off from God. You couldn't know God. You couldn't live for the purposes of God. He says the ransom was not paid by mere gold or silver. He paid for you. He paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him for this purpose long before the world began, but now in these final days he is, was sent to the earth for all to see. He did this for you. Let the weight of that grip you this morning. Let the weight of that last statement sink deep into your heart. He did this for you. Don't miss that. We talked about this earlier in the week. Don't miss that he did this for you. For you, Jesus came. For you, Jesus lived. For you, Jesus suffered. For you, Jesus was mocked. For you, Jesus was tortured. For you, Jesus was spit on. For you, he was reviled. For you. For you, he was nailed to the cross. For you, he died. And for you, he rose from the dead. He conquered your sin. N not just the sin of the world. He conquered your sin. He conquered your death. You see, we talk about Jesus conquering death, and he did. But he didn't just conquer death in general. He conquered your death if you're in Christ. He conquered your sin, your death. He conquered your grave so he could offer you grace. So he could give you himself. 
I mean, it wasn't like Zacchaeus was like, I'm going to give half my wealth away and I'm going to pay people back four times. And Jesus didn't say, whoa, 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 Zacchaeus. You're just way too excited. I know you just got saved and it's exciting, but it'll wear off. You know, you just need to give 10%, Zacchaeus. And go to church on Sunday, okay? And try to be a nice person. In, in that sort of how we are sometimes conditioned that we might think we should respond to grace. Zacchaeus said, I'm going to give half my wealth away and pay people back four times what I told for them. And Jesus said, that's it. You're getting grace. And grace is getting you. We know how Zacchaeus responded, but how have you responded? And how will you respond to the grace of God? Isaac Watts put it like this. He said, but drops of t tears can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. And I don't think you could really sum up the response that you and I should have to the grace of God any better than that. He says the proper response to grace is to say, God, you can have my life. And today I want to invite you to give your life to Jesus Christ. I, I don't mean just to ask Him to be your Savior. I don't mean to just want to go to heaven when you die and for you to be a little bit nicer person before you do. I want to ask you to give your life to the very one who came and who lived the life that you couldn't live, a perfect life, who died in your place, who rose from the dead, and who has lavished His love and His grace upon you. And I want to challenge you to give your life to Jesus Christ. Giving your life to Jesus Christ begins by recognizing that He owns it, that He bought it, that He deserves it. And the greatest thing that you can do with this life now is to give it to Jesus Christ. And it begins by saying one big yes to God and then it begins by starting to say yes to God every single day. God, whatever you want, whatever you want to do, the only reasonable response to grace is complete surrender. There's no other reasonable response to the lavish grace of God than to lay down your life and say, God, you can have my life. You can have my dreams. You can have my plans. You can have my everything. God began to bring me to that place 19 years ago when I was a camper here. When I came to camp that summer, I knew my plans. I was going to go to chef school. I had picked out my school. In fact, just last year, I'm someone who sort of collects papers and keeps things. Anybody else sort of, you know, you just can't throw anything out? All right. And yeah, I keep them, but I lose them. But eventually I find them years later. And I'm sure that paper that I couldn't find, I'll find years later. But I found my application to culinary school. And it was a real reminder to me of God's grace because I was so set and determined on what I was going to do. You see, I originally wanted to be a meteorologist, but then I realized you had to be smart. <laughs> and so I was like, I will just be a cook. But God intersected my life and he began to make me realize that my life wasn't my own and that I needed to lay down my life and my dreams and my plans. And I want you to, there's nothing greater that you could do for your life than to say, God, I'm going to give you my plans. I'm going to give you my dreams. And here, I know it's, it seems scary, but think about who you're laying your life down before. The one who loves you with an inexhaustible love. Who gives grace upon grace upon grace. Who loved you in the past. He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. He loves you in your present. He loves you right now. And he loves you in the future. Your destiny is secure in grace. And Paul summed it up like this for his life. And this has really become the summary that I want my life to be about. He says, I do not account my life of any value. He says, when I do the math about my life, he says, my life is not important anymore. Because it's not about me anymore. He says, I don't count my life of any value, nor is precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. I don't know what it is that God will call you to. But I know this, if you'll say yes to God and you'll say, God, my life is yours. You can have it, you can take it, you can do whatever you want with it. I promise you this, God will answer that prayer. 
and he will fulfill the destiny and the purpose for which he created you. And it might be that that will be a destiny and a purpose in the music field. It might be that God will call you to the mission field. It might mean that he'll do for you what he did for me and call you to be a pastor. I don't know what it is and you don't have to figure all that out right now. You just have to be willing to say, God, whatever it is, wherever it is, I am yours because of your grace. Would you bow your heads this morning and just in a moment of reflection and prayer, I want to challenge you to give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. Not just to be your Savior, but saying, God, you can have me, all of me, because of your grace. Not because God demands something that we have to give Him, but because of His incredible love and His grace. How many of you this morning, you just, you, you say, I, I would like to make that commitment. Would you raise your hand so I could pray for you? Would you just raise that up real high so I can see it? Thank you so much for your courage. Let me pray for each of you. Father, I thank you for your overwhelming grace. Father, I thank you for how you have displayed your grace in my life over and over and over again. And Father, I know how undeserving I am of your grace. Lord, we all are. But Father, I thank you that out of the riches of your love and your kindness, you choose to lavish your grace on undeserving sinners. And Father, I pray that we would realize the depth of your love and of your grace. And Father, I pray that we would not be those who would treat your grace as though it were meaningless. But Father, I pray that our response might be that we surrender all of our lives to you, to say yes to you. And Father, I pray you take our lives and use them for your glory. Father, I thank you for everyone who raised their hand this morning. Father, I thank you for their willingness to commit to saying yes to you. I pray that you would honor that commitment and do a deep work of your grace in their hearts. And Father, for each of us, may you bring us to that place of surrender, that you might be glorified in our lives, and that we might live lives that testify to the grace that you have shown us. We love you because you loved us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.